and welcome to the next episode of Bones and Stones. Today we have Iris uh, Guillemard who's joined us. I've probably mispronounced your surname. I'm sorry. I know how to spell it. I always get the spelling right, but the pronunciation, I've probably got it off. Um, and she's joining us to talk <laughs> about um, her PhD, uh, which she submitted two weeks ago. So big congratulations. I know it's a huge weight off your shoulders when you finally get that thing off. Um, it's such a massive task. It's so daunting. Um, it doesn't get necessarily easier after you've submitted because you know the reviews are coming, which which can be quite scary as well. But congrats. Um, and uh, today we were hoping you could just tell us a bit about your PhD and your findings and what you, di what you did. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my PhD focused on the lithic technologies, so the stone tools of hunter-gatherers during the late Holocene in Southern Africa, so from around 3000 before present uh, to through the second millennium AD. And what I did is uh, investigate a bit of lithic technology, so try to understand what people were making um, at a time that is really, really interesting because, I mean, as you know, Tim, because this is also your field of, of expertise <laughs> completely. Uh, it's when there are lots of super interesting social processes that happens uh, with the introduction of sheep, so the beginning of herding practices by hunter-gatherers, uh, but also the appearance of pottery and all of that. So there are lots of very interesting social things happening at this time. The idea was a bit to look at uh, firstly what the lithic technologies of the hunter-gatherers at this time are, um, and then to see how it changes or stays stable through time. So from around from my side from around 2000 before present to more recently through the second millennium AD. So this is, this is what I've been, I've been doing for the PhD. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's been really, really interesting. And I especially worked on one site, which is the site of Baleno Men Shelter, uh, which is located in the Limpopo area. So in the Shashi Limpopo Conference area, so really up north. Uh, South Africa, uh, close to the border with uh, Botswana and, Zimba and Zimbabwe. So yeah, so I've been I've been looking at at this site, uh, looking at the lithic technology there, and then I also like did a big literature review on uh, what is happening elsewhere in Southern Africa and see if we can compare the scenario that I observed in this site with other sites. And then, so you're working so below the main um, over the, the last sort of the 3,000 BP onwards. Um, why did you choose yep. to focus on the assemblages post-dating about 3000 BP? I mean, why that particular um, date? Yeah, so the reason why I focused on this period of time is because I was really interested especially in this transition, in, in the moments when uh, pottery uh, potentially sheep, well, it's not the case at Balearno Man Shelter, so there's no, there's no sheep bone there, uh, but we see pottery at this time. And the, the reason why I focused especially on the layers dated from this period, because they are also layers that are a bit older, yeah. is, um, is because uh, I was just really interested in this, in this period of time. And it's actually, there's, there's so much already to think of, to investigate, especially because my aim was also to compare with the rest of Southern Africa. And um, it's, uh, it's, there's lots to read. It's very, very complex. Uh, there's a lot to understand. Yeah. So, I just thought that focusing on this very question was maybe a bit more uh, precise and powerful rather than looking at the whole yeah. uh, sequence. Mm. So just because I know the site from my own research as well, um, you know, if you look at the inventory of archaeological material found in the shelter, which is quite impressive, it includes yeah. a pendant and in the later assemblages, a glass bead, some pottery and various other things. Um, so what, I, what strikes me about that particular site is that from the pre-contact level, so from before the arrival of herding and farming communities in the area, and all the way through until it's, mm. it's, it's, it's sort of you know, abandonment around AD 1300, there are yeah. some changes in, t in terms of artifact representation and, and also numeric density, but generally the site seems fairly consistent in how it was used and how it was utilized and so on. And when mm -hmm. I think of it, I always think of how interesting it is from that point of view, because you have so much changing on that landscape in terms of political yeah. orientation, social landscape, uh, social uh, relations and so on. And you see that in some of the other hunter-gatherer sites, but not really at Belerno, Maine. So in the lithic yeah. technology, 
is it similar? Are you seeing from a technological perspective, general consistency, or are there changes that are occurring at certain times? No, so it's it's very consistent. So the, the listic technology uh, is very consistent. So it also confirms the study that was made by Brown and Van Donner, who work, worked, uh, work, sorry, worked on the site before. Um, and yeah, no, so what I see is a very, very consistent listic technology. So okay. there's no really changes through time, which is actually very interesting. And one aim of the PSG was also to ask why uh, do listic technology remain stable at this site, but also in other places in Southern Africa. Uh, Southern Africa is very interesting for that. Um, when thinking about neolithization processes and um, like generally the evolution of lithic technologies, you know, uh, because in other places of the world, we're going to see potentially changes in the lithic technologies uh, at the you know, neolithization and then, you know, through time. And in Southern Africa, you have lots of very different situations. So you have cases like in Balenumen Shelter, we see the continuity of the lithic technology. And in other places of Southern Africa, it's actually the same. So um, it's what Janet Deacon was saying in her PhD, you know, she was saying, well, we have this overall impression that there is a continuity of the basic technologies from around 2000 BP onwards. And there are changes in other places, but the, the timing of this change might be slightly older. So basically from around 4000 BP, there are things changing in the basic technologies, but from 4000 BP onwards, there are much less changes. Mm except in certain areas. So potentially in Amakwaland, in places like that, um, it's, um, it's slightly different. So that was also what was really interesting. It was to compare yeah. what is happening in different areas and to question the stability and potentially changes in, in other places. Okay. And um, yeah, so... Okay. So I... I but you yes, know. To, to, Yes. I could talk about this, you know, all day long. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to Matt because otherwise I'm going to get carried away. Matt, you've got some questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Iris, I've been waiting with a question since about two minutes in. So <laughs> Tim's been hogging the, uh, hogging the interview. But um, so, yeah, what I wanted to, to ask you is um, your, your, uh, you guys have been talking about the consistency in, in the assemblages uh, across different sites and stuff. And this is uh, something I also posed to Tim as well. I mean, considering that your research was up in that region as well. And, and Tim, you looked at the spaces between places. You looked at a lot of the surface accumulations in between the rock shelters and then tried to adopt a more landscape-based approach in terms of understanding lithic technology changes by looking at possible differences in site use within a landscape. So Iris, uh, maybe um, to, to talk a little, let's maybe talk to that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that perhaps you are seeing consistency in the lithic technology in the rock shelters because that potentially relates to a consistency in activities within those spaces? And then in the surface assemblages, there is perhaps more variability. Uh, yes, there are other issues of preservation, uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, open air mm -hmm. scatters as well, deflated uh, context and things like that. But just uh, from my perspective, also from a landscape perspective, I'm a little bit biased coming in um, with a geoarchaeology kind of approach. But to me, that's, that's really interesting. There was another question which I had as well, um, which is now eluding me. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting point. Sure. No, it is super interesting. And I think that definitely we should look more at these open air sites. The team has done lots of work with that, but globally in Southern Africa, they, they, they aren't so many, like mostly it's rock shelters. And what I saw from kind of reading and just looking at the listic technology, like what I could see, you know, from the available literature is that it's actually, it actually seems quite consistent, um, meaning that um, you might have differences in the kind of tools that are going to be represented, but overall, typologically, uh, it seems rather consistent uh, at a large scale. So, um, yeah, that would be, I think, I think that there's much more to see there. And definitely, especially when talking about migrations and people, you know, potentially coming with their listic te technologies from other places uh, from further north. I think that there, yeah, there's definitely lots of work to do to investigate, to see if we could see signals, you know, of 
uh, potentially different technologies. At the moment, it's a little bit difficult um, to know a bit more about that. But yeah, uh, definitely. From, from what I see, I, I would say that it's rather consistent typologically, technologically, and that then, yes, you're going to have different activities uh, that might be represented by different kind of tools. But the, the technologies and what people are making is overall similar. When you talk about LSA sites, mm -hmm. then you have all the questions of the assemblages that are close to Iron Age sites or that are the, the potentially, you know, like Stone Age artifacts that are used by, uh, you know, in Iron Age context. And these are very, very interesting questions. And they are also differences. At the moment, it's a bit difficult to know more. Mm -hmm. um, because I actually haven't looked at these uh, assemblages. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to talk more about that. Uh, but it's, I would say uh, just like that from, you know, from far away in, as an impression, I think that there, there are potentially differences. So I think it would be super interesting to look a bit more at these Iron Age sites and the listics that are found close to them or as Tim, you know, did during, uh, during his PhD. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Iris. And and just um, just a follow up question with regards to that. Uh, in your PhD, how much um, kind of uh, information are you dedicating towards uh, comparative stuff? Um, so, for example, the research that Tim has done within the the, the area there, the region. Mm -hmm. um, are you are you looking um, you know quite heavily at at doing comparisons, or or did you? Um, and then. Um, yeah, I mean, sorry, there was there was another point. Th this is my issue is that I always think of a really cool question and then by the time um, it comes around to me, I then forget what I want to say. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, always noting, I'm always noting down uh, points on the on the side here. But yeah, so what's interesting for me is obviously that comparability aspect mm. uh, in terms of looking what has been done elsewhere. And sorry, this is the other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, with your PhD and the, and the reviews, do you expect uh, possibly when the reviews come back, um, that um, there'll be a discussion about your reliance on using a rock shelter assemblage versus looking at other smaller, maybe ephemeral as assemblages as well. Tim, presumably that's something you had to engage with as well with your research was then integrating the data sets where you've got rock shelters, where the preservation conditions are really good and generally you're dealing with much bigger assemblages. Yeah. And then you've got these kind of smaller secondary context um, scatters in between. Mm. So yeah, about that, I don't know. I'll, I'll see. I'll see what they say. Uh, for now, for now, all what I did is that I basically looked at everything that was published. So I, I did one precise study of one site, and then I compared it with the existing, you know, pu publications with other other sites that were uh, close by, but also more globally in Southern Africa. So. I'll, I'll see what they say. Obviously, that would be super interesting to look, you know, more at these ephemeral sites and to have more comparisons uh, using lithic technologies between them. At the moment, it's not something that I did, but definitely that would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Matt, you know, on your two, sort of both of your questions, uh, what's really interesting about this topic as well is you have this sort of classic, uh, you know, an older discussion around basing yourselves at a single site versus landscape. And th these are conversations that have been had, you know, in Southern Africa for, for years, you know, John Parkington and colleagues and so on. And on this landscape, what's, what's really cool at the site like Belerna, which I think it's a, it's a fascinating site, is that, you know, you, earlier on you spoke about, you know, the um, accumulation of these, or consistency rather, of behavior patterns at this one site. And, and like, if you look at Belerna Main, what's quite interesting, and you look at the variety, it has this aggregation-like quality to it. Maybe it is an aggregation site as was recorded ethnographically, or maybe it's something similar, but it has these similar features. And those are consistent throughout time. So it is as if the site was used in the same way over time. And at a time when at other sites like Little Muck, for example, Little Muck, you see incredible change happening there um, from about 2000 years ago, from about the introduction of sheep and farmers and so on. Um, and it's really cool. So when you start to translate these, these, these sort of single sites or, and mute them into the landscape, um, suddenly you start to see these little idiosyncrasies start mm. coming up. And of course, then with this period of time, the discussion is, you know, um, are we seeing one group of foragers or a small a community of foragers or a population of foragers moving between these sites, doing different things at these sites? Because that's what we'd expect from the ethnographic record and mobility at least. Or are we seeing people basing themselves at sites? You know, we're not talking about a desert landscape, 
that you know has patches patches of resources we're talking about quite a rich landscape with a lot of animal a lot of plants that you can rely on water that's abundantly available might require a bit of digging but you know so you don't have to be as mobile in order to survive so suddenly the sort of conversation starts to change mm -hmm. and when we look at this it becomes a bit tricky actually like you know to extract these social elements from the data and i think like with iris's study it's going to be really interesting because the i think the level of technology and correct me if i'm wrong here but the technological study that you've done is probably the most advanced technological study that's been done in the valley because uh, bronwyn did it to an extent i didn't do a deeply tech i was mostly typological looking at other elements so your study is going to, I think, bring a whole new element of data into these valley discussions, which is quite exciting. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, and you're absolutely right to say that you know there's lots of questions around, um, like, are people kind of staying um, socially? Uh, can Can you hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think Tim's uh, just frozen. Oh, okay, okay, Tim frozen. Yeah. So yeah, so they, they, it's very interesting because I think at the moment, and Tim worked a lot on that, um, knowing basically why at one side you know things are going to remain rather stable, or and at other sides you know are going to change mm -hmm. and how and why, uh, these are really really interesting questions, and I also got quite interesting in these questions in my PhD, but I worked more with the rather that inter-site variability, rather than focusing on that, I focused more on the question of techno complexes. Okay. So basically when we are looking at techno complexes, why do we see these very big uh, kind of logical entities mm. and what could that mean? Potentially, why do we have this, um, what some people say, uh, transcultural uh, elements that exist, this kind of technical phenomena that are shared and the question that you know I also investigated a bit was, why do we have these very big repartitions of things that look the same, you know, um, from a typological point of view and potentially also from a technological point of view? But we'll have to look at that a bit more. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think in a way it's very exciting because having worked at that site and starting to compare it uh, with other sites, I could also see that there's potentially it's, is lots of diversity uh, in the kind of technologies that hunter gatherers are doing at this time. Oh, wow. And what I, what I saw from the, you know, the, the SLCA, so around, around the area of Valerno, is that it seems rather similar, you know, like the technology seems rather similar, even though there are changes through time. But if you compare it with other areas, so for example, in the Maluti Drakensberg area, or in the Northern Cape, or even in Botswana, uh, there they are there are changes. Okay. And yeah, it seems it seems like it. I mean, definitely, there's, we need to make so many more studies. But that's also really interesting when discussing. Um, you know, different maybe regional traditions, uh, and then what could then potentially be the implications for what happens after, you know, um, adoption of herding practices, all of that. I mean, I think there's lots to think about in terms of uh, differences yeah. in the social organization of hunter gatherers. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Iris, I think we're yeah. going to have to cut it off there. It's been a fascinating sure. conversation. Um, and, you know, best of luck with the reviews. I, I hope they come back uh, positive and, and relatively easy to deal with. And um, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing your PhD. Obviously, it's my research area as well. So I'm quite excited to see what you found. And, uh, oh, and I think this, this kind of conversation is so important to have. Uh, we would have been seeing you in a, in a, you know, in a, in a couple of months uh, at SAFA had it gone through. And it would be nice to have yeah. talked about this. And obviously, we had our own session there. But uh, I'm looking forward to eventually hosting that session when we get the opportunity to next year, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but thanks very much for joining us and taking time out of your day to spend a bit of time chatting about your research. And yeah, we look forward to, to, to seeing what comes from it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. And good Thank luck. Have a, have a good day and yeah. Yeah, keep the force. We will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.